admire and familiar texts, the ones that we know well and uh, love and sometimes misunderstand. Today's text is all about the change that occurs with the new birth transformation that God wants to bring about in our lives, making us a new creation. And it said that way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, to be in Christ is to have everything changed. Paul wrote it this way, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I want to share with you this morning two very important considerations to remember about exchanging the old people we were for the new person that Christ offers and wants us to be. The first of those is how it begins in the first place. New birth comes by surrendering my sins. That's, uh, that's as close to uh, the invitation at the end of a revival that we can give. If you want new birth, you surrender your sins. You surrender the fact that you are a sinner to Christ. That's not a strange thing to hear in a Christian church, is it? Uh, the surrendered life has begun when a person bows in obedience to the Word of God. Foremost in that experience is that prominent surrender to Christ as we accept His free offer of salvation. I think that most... Uh, at least most people have a rudimentary understanding that where something like this is concerned, you do not put the cart before the horse. Isn't that a funny picture, by the way, to see a cart pulling a horse instead of the other way around? But it paints that picture, doesn't it? And some people do indeed do that. Some people try to do that, live the Christian life by going to church and being nice and always helping and giving money and even serving in the church and the community. Sometimes they stand behind a pulpit and preach. But that is not following God's instructions. That's attempting to earn God's approval. The cart, in this case, is all those things. Going to church, giving up our tithes and offerings, serving Christ in the church and out, witnessing to Christ. That is the cart. The horse that comes before is confessing our sins, is giving our sins to God. Um, God's instruction is to empty ourselves of whatever goodness that we think we may possess and trust in Christ in the goodness that He had and what He did for us on the cross. It's a matter of, to put it in baseball language, you got to touch first base before you can go to second or third, or home. You have got to touch that first base. And that first base is the horse that pulls the wagon, if you will. It is surrendering our sins. That's what it means to accept Christ as Savior. You confess, or you surrender your sins to Him, so that His blood sacrifice on the cross can actually cleanse your sins. Um, everything that you've ever done against God's will, everything that makes you unfit for heaven, 1 John 1 9 puts it this way if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That unrighteousness is the King James word. In this New Living Translation, it says wickedness. I think that's a really good translation of that word to cleanse us from all wickedness. Now, that doesn't mean that all possibility of wickedness is taken away. How many of you know that we can go back to witness, uh, to wickedness? We can go back to evil. We can go back to unrighteousness. Well, the surrender of your sins is the beginning of your life with Christ. But there's more than that, isn't there? As a matter of fact, when you have a horse, the horse is somewhat useless unless you just want to ride somewhere. The horse or the mule is useless unless you've got a car that goes along with it. And that horse is supposed to pull that cart, is it not? What is the cart represented? It represents the church experience. It represents the body of Christ experience. It represents your service. And so the horse of salvation, if you will, pulls the cart of living the life as a Christian and being useful as a Christian. So the initial surrender 
is also a daily surrender to which we are surrendering. In other words, when you give your sins to Christ, you are then forgiven, and then you are surrendering to a lifetime of surrender. Let's explore that a little bit. Every day is a day of choosing to obey the will and the call of God to trust and obey in every intention and thought and act of the life that you live. That is how the change happens when we bend our will to match His. New birth comes by surrendering my sins. And then the second consideration is new life. New birth begins by surrendering my sins to Him. New life comes from God's Spirit transforming me. How does that happen? We go back to the, the horse and the cart. The horse is salvation. That is the first experience. That must go first. That must proceed. But then there's the cart. Put this picture in your mind if it's not too irreverent. The Holy Spirit climbs up in that cart with you. And He's working on you as you're riding that cart. The salvation that pulls you along. The salvation that will eventually take you to heaven. And the Holy Spirit is in the cart with you and He's working on you. He's telling you, no, 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 turn this way, not that way. That's the wrong way to turn. Turn over this way. And, uh, uh, you know, hold back on that a little bit. Hurry up here. You know, the Holy Spirit is giving us guidance all the way along. New life comes from the Spirit of God transforming us, giving us a new life. So, as we unfold this, this second consideration, which is the major consideration for us this morning, we have to think about in all the surrendering and the obedience that there is an ongoing change and it is an incremental change. It is a change that happens bit by bit by bit. Some people call it baby steps. We begin with Christ in baby steps. Sometimes there's a leap. I think that first the horse of salvation is a leap of faith. I don't think you can, um, you can't take baby steps into relief. You either believe or you don't. And if you don't believe, there comes a time, if you will, when you do believe. When you do cross from, as the Bible says, death unto life. It is the point of belief and of trusting in Christ. So, as you walk with Christ, you become more like Him. As you're saved, you then walk with Christ. And as you walk with Christ, you become more like Him. I think that's so true of us as humans. Uh, did your mother ever tell you that you were hanging out with the wrong crowd or not to hang out with the wrong crowd? Let me see your hands if your mother said something or your father or whatever. Yeah. Um, I had that said to me. And what's that old expression? If you lie down with the dogs, you're going to get up with... Please. And why did everybody know that? It's because you've heard that any number of times, but you also know what it means. I mean, who hasn't, you know, gotten up with fleas, you know? Um, we go to great extent and expense to make sure that the dog in our house does not have fleas. I mean, uh, that's the last thing in the world we want. But in the same and the opposite way, isn't it true that while if you lay down with the dog, you're going to get up with fleas. You hang out with the wrong crowd, you're going to get the wrong idea. If you hang out with the Son of God, on the opposite side of this coin, if you hang out with the Son of God who is good and gentle and peaceful and long-suffering and joyful and loving and patient and kind and faithful, what do you get up with? You get up covered with the fruit of the Spirit, don't you? So the idea of a church, the idea about the cart being drawn by the horse is that you hang out with the Holy Spirit in that cart and you become more like Jesus every day and in every way. This is transformation. It's not something you can put on. It's not something that you can do for yourself. But it's something that the Holy Spirit will do in you and for you as you hang out with Him. This is transformation. It's a matter of being formed day by day, step by step into the image of Christ. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, Paul put it this way about God knowing us. By the way, when did God begin to know you? When you were about 10 or 12? When, when did God begin? How about when you were 5? 2? How about before you were born? Before you were conceived? How about before the foundation of the earth? 
That's what Paul wrote. That's what Paul was meaning when he wrote, for whom he did foreknow. To fore, to mean, to use the word foreknow means foreknowledge. God had foreknowledge of who you are before you were born. Said that about Jeremiah, didn't he? Called before he was in the womb. Well, Paul wrote it this way, for whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. What does it mean to conform something? How many of you have ever taken raw hamburger and formed it into a patty? Have you done that? You've taken a handful, a big handful, and formed it into a nice juicy hamburger? How about the snow out there? Did you ever as a child go out and gather up a bunch of snow? What do you do with it? You pack it as tightly as you can. You are conforming it to the image of a sphere that you're going to hit your teacher in the back of the head. Uh, no, wait a minute. No. Parents correct each other with that. I know it's early, but stay with me, all right? How many of you are tired from last night? I mean, the switch is there. But are you going to vote for that? Righteous senators, they'll end that thing, you know? Okay. Your character is being changed when you're being conformed to the image of Christ. The sin that you struggled against and mostly lost is now being conquered. As you give your life to Christ, both in the course of salvation, if you will, and the day-to-day -day ride in that cart with the Holy Spirit as you give yourself to Christ, that sin is being conquered. Temptation may still come after you, Let's face it, you know, Satan doesn't give up. Just because you got saved doesn't mean that Satan thinks he's lost the battle, especially with you. Is it possible to turn your back on Christ? I've seen it. Have you not seen that? Have you not seen somebody who was hot for God at one point and suddenly turned and went in the opposite direction? But now, as you give your life to Christ, even though temptation comes after you, the very thing that you used to really care for or like, but the one thing that you couldn't resist, that besetting sin, so to speak, has now become repulsive, and you begin to turn your back on it. That's what the Holy Spirit does in working on us and in us. Instead, you're being prepared by God's Spirit to walk, to, to walk joyfully freed and ready to help and serve other people. Choosing to surrender my sins to Christ, whether they be past sins or present sins or even future sins, the first step in the way that God deals with us on the inside is in that choice. In the choice that we make to say no to the sin that has been after us. Instead, here, Paul knew the value of making a, a very definite choice at this point. Did you know that some choices are so vital and you get really very quick feedback. It's like that for me. The feedback I get when I choose to give up my sin is usually very quick. It's very, very dramatic. It's like grabbing a live electric wire that's bare. You know, you, you get instant feedback. You know something has happened. Well, Satan is a master at providing that. Let me create a scenario for you. How many of you have ever been to a, uh, like a fall revival and you know, at the end of the service the preacher offers the invitation and you're invited to come to the front and pray? Uh, have you ever knelt at an altar like this? I have. I'm sure some of you have. And what is it that you do when you get there? What do you pray for when you get there? Isn't it God help me with this? God help me with that? God save me from this or that or the other? What is the next thing that happens? You know what it is. Satan is all over your face. The minute you decide to serve Christ in any way in your life, whether it's to give up a bad habit, whether it's to uh, start doing a good habit that you know you should have been doing, whatever it is, the next thing, <coughs> Satan is after you. The temptation comes around again. I want to give you an illustration of this. I may have even used that, this before. And I, this is not a pat on Russell's back here because it does have a kind of happy ending to it. Uh, this is just an illustration because it's something that happened in my life. I, I want to make an, an emphatic five-word 
sentence statement. I used to hate smoking. Now let me tell the truth. I actually, I loved it a lot. I love to smoke. I mean, I love to smoke day and night. I love to smoke every cigarette I ever lifted to my face. I love those things. I used to love it about three packs a day kind of love. But I knew that I wanted to quit. I knew that I needed to quit. My witness for Christ demanded that I quit. My health demanded that I quit. Not to mention my breath demanding that I needed to quit. I needed to quit. And every time I tried to quit, the negative feedback, like grabbing an electric wire, kicked in. The feedback was fear. What if I can't do it? What if, I, you know, oh man, oh, it's, this is going to hurt so much. What if I can't do it? What, why is it necessary anyway? Why do I, why do I, all of this fear welling up inside of Russell. After so many times of starting and failing to quit, I did what I should have done in the first place. I gave up. I didn't give up quitting. I gave up thinking that Russell had the strength to quit. I began to realize, I didn't begin to, I suspected it all along, that I was being rather arrogant in thinking I could do anything, especially with a habit that had me. You know, as I understand, cigarettes are a lot more addictive today than they were back in the day when I did. And, you know, so it is, it is such a hard habit to quit. And if, and if you do smoke, I'm not hurling insults at you here. What I'm, what I'm saying is I understand. I understand how hard it is. And in fact, I had a dear friend, had a friend, he passed away not too long ago, but about 30 years ago, he asked me to pray for him because he couldn't quit. And uh, you know what? I knew what it was like and prayed the prayer of faith over that. And I prayed for him, and the next thing he wound up in the hospital. Uh, not because of my prayer, but because he believed in the prayer, and uh, he believed in what he had prayed for as we prayed together. And then he did the very foolish thing of lighting up another cigarette. And God gave him what he asked for. Because when he prayed, he asked God, Make those cigarettes make me sick. And he went, he wound up in the hospital with a heart attack. This was a dear friend of mine, Elizabeth can attest to this. This is a, this is a, I mean, if, if his wife Pam was standing here, she said, that's exactly what happened, that doofus. Doofus, she called her husband a doofus. Well, I quit, I quit thinking that I could quit. And I began praying, God, if you want me to give up the security I feel each time I satisfy that craving in my, in my body, God, you're going to have to give me the kind of strength that I never knew existed. Because I've never known a tougher fight than this. I'd been to Vietnam. <laughs> I'd had playground fights with other kids. But man, this, this habit of mine was just too big, and I could not conquer it. I couldn't. And I began to pray in faith, and then I gave it another shot. By praying in faith, I mean I confess to God, I don't have the strength to do this. I'm going to be a lifetime addict to cigarettes, to tobacco. And that's how I pray in faith. And incidentally, my last cigarette was 43 years ago. God took it away. I have to confess this. For a long time thereafter, every time somebody else lit one up, I wanted one so bad. But God began to transform me in that area and give me victory over that one thing. Now, I don't know what your problems are and what you would like to give up or what you can't seem to manage to do and you really want to do it. But in writing to the Corinthian believers, the apostle was stating the basic tenet of the faith here. When you make that definite choice to follow Christ, it's going to have an instant effect, both in heaven and in hell. In heaven, God is going to say, yes, I'll give you the power for what you're asking for. But in hell, Satan says, you watch me. You watch me with this one. And the struggle starts again, just like it did with Job. You remember? 
Job was a good man, serving God. What did the devil do? He waltzed into heaven and he said, Yeah, man, I'm going to go test me some people. And God said, Have you considered my servant Job? And the battle was on. It's going to have an instant effect when you make that choice for God. But it's going to change the future, everything about the future. And if not, there was no genuine faith in your prayer. The old life has to be history. The new life transforms us into spiritually aware children of God who not only act differently, but our perception, our perception of things, our focus on everything becomes different. <clears throat> The desires we have in that cart with the Holy Spirit as the horse of salvation draws us along. Our desires change from worldly to heavenly. Our view of self changes or transforms from selfish pride to humility and generosity. Our priorities should change from doing and getting and having to being and helping and loving. That's quite a change. But it's more than just the worm to the butterfly thing either. It's a change from emptiness to a sharing in the kingdom. It's all the difference between a child playing with trucks or dolls to an adult who can unlock the secrets of the universe. That's what that salvation and the cart of the Holy Spirit and you are all about. But in this change, this transformation is not going to happen, folks, if we place our faith in the world's culture and values instead of God's word. Paul addressed that too in Romans 12 too. He said, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think, the renewing of your mind. C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite authors, and he wrote this, Christianity, if it's false, is of no importance. Can I get an amen there? Or not. Hear it again. Christianity, if it's true, said that backwards. Christianity, if false, is of no importance. If the gospel is false, it's not important at all. The second half is, of his statement is, if true, it's of infinite importance. What does he do? He's playing devil's advocate with the first part of that sentence. And then he was bringing in the truth at the end. He made one more statement. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. The one thing it cannot be is take it or leave it. It's either true and infinitely important, important or it's false and not important at all. What C.S. Lewis is saying to us is, listen up, if Christianity is true, act like it. <clears throat> Go all in or go home. Let him have all of you or admit you really don't believe. When it comes to the king of kings, lukewarm never cuts it. I've met a lot of people in more than seven decades of living. I've met those who don't believe that Christianity is true at all, any more than they believe in the tooth fairy. I've also met those who believe Christianity is so important that they are what most of us would clarify or classify as fanatics. I don't classify them as fanatics. I call them genuine all-in believers. <laughs> but there's a third group that I've met. Those who believe Christianity is absolutely true and of utmost importance, but they treat it as if it was an addendum to their life. I added Jesus to my life, not I gave my life to Jesus. Do you see the difference there? Isn't there a big difference there? Sure it is. I mean, uh, I can add this phone to my life. You know, once it was in the store, I paid them an exorbitant amount of money, and they gave it to me, and I added it to my life. Here it is, right? Instead, if I walked into the store and I gave me over to the camera person, now, that's a, you know, that's a wildly absurd illustration, but you get the point. There's a difference between adding Jesus to your life, meaning you use him like a vending machine, and adding your life into Jesus' kingdom, giving yourself to him entirely. 
C.S. Lewis said, Christianity cannot be moderately important. I've uh, met folks like that where they go to church on Sunday, they give some money, they sing a song, they even sing in choirs, they help out in church and community. They even stand behind pulpits and preach from time to time, or every week. They're really good people. Here's the question before the house today. What kind are you? What kind am I? Do you add Christ to your life? Or do you give your life to Christ so that he can transform you in every way completely? And evidently change or trans transformation is not the most popular word in the English language these days. Most of us do not like change, and I admit the older I get, probably this applies to me and describes me too, that I don't like change. But in his letter to the Corinthian church, Paul was advocating for us to not despise the change, to keep the change, to keep this new <coughs> life in Christ fresh, ever changing. That doesn't mean certain tenets of the faith are going to change, you know. Heaven is sweet, hell is hot. Jesus died for our sins. Marriage is for one man and one woman for one lifetime. I mean, these things are the verities of the faith, and they will not change because God's Word says that He does not change. But our view of what God can do in our life, folks, if we're any more than baby Christians, we will begin to realize that we're not much more than baby Christians. And God has so much more to teach us. And so we have to stay open to His changing our life and us being willing to change. That change is the newness of life in Christ that happens as a gift from God. When in repentance we give our heart, we give our will to Him, the change specifically in that transaction is a reconciling. A sinner has been forgiven and reckoned a saint in God's eyes. In other words, God has seen you lifted off from the miry clay and placed in the cart that salvation's horse is going to draw through life. And the Holy Spirit is busy hosing you down, washing off whatever you've got in the miry clay down there. And God is purifying you and cleansing you and changing you. Now that part of the transaction is wonderful. And if you've experienced that, you're already acknowledging and shaking your head in agreement. That's only part of the transaction. That is entry level. That's 101. The other part is living that change, keeping the change fresh and in focus daily and passing the change along to others. A person who truly surrenders his sins expects to surrender for life, for change. This is what Paul had in mind when he said that we're Christ's ambassadors. We're given a wonderful ministry of inviting people to remember that image of God that's stamped on their souls. And we're giving the change melody to play loud for our friends and neighbors and acquaintances. And we are to play that music until the whole of humanity, like a giant orchestra, is all tuning up their instrument to the music that God wants them to play. Keeping the change is not about rearranging the furniture in the church or getting new music forms or different styles of worship or clothes or uh, cars or hairstyles. Keeping the change isn't also about policing other people's behavior. You don't have to try to keep other people straight. That's God's job. That's for them and the Holy Spirit to figure out. Our job is to announce what the wonderful change is all about. You know, you, you can try to control other people's behave you the way they do things, but you're not going to change him any more than I could change my dog. Uh, some of you have met my little dog, Welly. He's about this big, and he weighs a lot more than he should. He's got a lot of fuzzy hair on him, and he barks too much, and his breath stinks. But you know what? I love that little dog. And uh, I mean, he's more well-behaved and better looking than probably your dog is, but uh, you know, he's just a dog. If I try to rearrange his behavior, I mean, what is he like to do? You know, if I try to rearrange his behavior, suppose I buy him an iPad and I show him how to entertain himself, little doggy clicks here and there, 
you know, to get all the doggy sites on there and all the, the laughs with the Facebook funnies and all that stuff. You know, and uh, he could write a daily doggy blog, you know, and express his feelings that way. But the minute my back is turned, what is my dog going to do? My dog is going to go out on the patio and look for lizards. I mean, he's a dog, and dogs do dog things. You can rearrange the behavior of somebody that doesn't believe in Christ so that they look like a Christian, walk like a Christian, talk like a Christian, jump in church like a Christian. Does that make them a Christian? Don't try to believe some people's behavior. Just announce that there is a Savior for what ails you. Keeping the change is offering Christ as you live, in your word, in your deed, as we live this new creation existence of being forgiven and thankful sinners, we recognize what a gift we've been given. Now I want to close this this morning with just a little bit of advice I got from a native of North Carolina who was raised over around Silo City, a guy by the name of Vance Hatton. Dr. Vance Hatton, a wonderful Baptist uh, evangelist who traveled the country, wrote about I don't know, 15 or 20, 25 books. And uh, I love Dr. Hadden. I had the opportunity to meet him during our last year in seminary. It's about 40 years ago. Dr. Hadden was about 95 at that point. He couldn't even stand behind the pulpit. He came to the seminary to do a bunch of lectures on ministers and ministry. And uh, I was like the other 1,200 students who didn't want to miss a single moment of listening to this great saint of God. Uh, he could hardly stand, and so instead of standing behind the pulpit, they brought a chair, and he sat there and he talked to us. And I took a lot of notes that week. He was with us for a full week, and one of those notes is dated April 23rd, 1981. He was speaking on ministry and ministers that burn out. And Dr. Hagner said that we have three choices, three different directions we could go in when we get to that point where we're so burned out. And the truth is, I don't believe he was talking just to ministers at that point. I was thinking he was talking to every believer who's ever grown in breath. He was talking to me, and by extension, as I share it to you, he was talking to you. He was talking to all believers, talking to all people, really. You have three different choices. And this is the way he said it. He said, when life is tough, and you don't see how you can go on any further, in what? in being God's child, in following through with those promises you made at an altar somewhere, in crying out to God and saying, God, if you'll just, then I will. Dr. Abner says, you got three choices when life gets that tough to see how you can get going again and carry on. He said, first of all, you can resign. You can give up. You can just quit. People do that, don't they? They quit on life. They quit their church. They quit their family. They quit this. They quit that. Everything they can. They quit. They just resign. They're done. People do that. Dr. Hatter said, you can resign. Or, number two, you can resign. What do you mean, Dr. Hatter? He said, you can just accept your difficult life as it is and say, Oh, well, this is just the way it is. Go on. Same old, same old. A lot of people do that. And then they trudge through life, going through the motions, and there's no life in it. That's not the new life that Jesus promised. He said, you can resign. You can resign. Or you can resign. You can be resigned. You can let God stamp a fresh new beginning on your soul. You can let him re-sign you inside and out. And God has used that bit of advice that Dr. Hadley gave that day to keep me going in some difficult times. I should say, mostly it's been that kind of thought that keeps me focused on always believing that there is a fresh start in God. That his mercies truly are new every morning. That's what being a new creation in Christ is all about. 
God can take a person who's used up, broken down, stale, and wasted, and as we daily surrender our sins in confession to Christ, there's a new life, and there's a new beginning, every day as he re-signs our ministry and our life by the transforming of power by God's Holy Spirit. So I've got an invitation for you this morning. You don't have to leave your seat and come up here. But I ask that you bow your head as we consider something here this morning. If it's been a while, I'd like you to take some time to look back at the pathway of transformation in your life. I want you to note particularly where Christ has taken the old person. Think about the person you were when you came to Christ. Think about the person you are now. And think about the change that has happened. And as you think about that, rejoice that when he saved you, he didn't just take away the penalty of sin and punch your ticket for heaven. He also started the process of sanctifying you and taking away even the desire to sin. He's giving you a heart of fire like his own. And listen, as your head is bowed, if you don't find much to rejoice about in this area, some things that you can celebrate and change, perhaps it's time to truly surrender and open up your heart to God's transforming power. He can do that. And the minute you do that, the minute you open your heart, Satan is going to whisper down into your ear, oh, you don't believe that. If that kind of stuff happens, maybe to other people, not you. You, you're mine. Let me encourage you this morning. Don't believe that. Trust in God. Take that leap of faith. Get right on that course of salvation. Surrender your sins to God. Let the Holy Spirit lift you out of the miry clay. Place you in that cart. That salvation's purpose is going to take all the way to heaven. Father, we love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask that it would be so in our lives that your Holy Spirit transform us, change us. We wouldn't look on change as an unhappy or unwanted thing. We would look on change as the beginning of new life in Christ. New life every morning. New life with every confession of sin. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.